Welcome back to our discussion on the follow-up to Rio Plus 20 and the post-2015 development agenda. I'm delighted to say that we have many interventions from member states and major groups planned over the next hour. So I am actually going to lay down the law a little bit. I've been told I've been too nice in the morning. That's the first time I've ever been told that. And you will see that in front of us we have a traffic light. And the traffic light has been set to three minutes. Um, after three minutes, it will go into the red, when I shall kindly ask you to stop talking. Uh, this is because we have uh, so many interventions, and we would like to hear your thoughts. While you digest that, um, in the spirit of interactivity, I am going to ask our panellists to briefly say a few words about what they have heard from you uh, during the morning uh, session. Um, David, would you like to start? Thank you. And very briefly, uh, recognising and seeing that people have been talking about how very much we're talking about multi-layer activities, multi-stakeholder activities. These efforts are going to require actually a different approach from policy makers and policy making. There's two aspects of this I'd like to underline. One is a focus on enabling conditions. That is what international organizations, countries, governments can provide, the enabling conditions to allow those different layers of society, cities, for example, and others, to interact and to uh, address these issues. The second is to support the integration and feedback of information, which I talked about this morning. One quick example, I used to live in northern Italy, went to Switzerland very often, and the telephones there used to, many years ago, have a little device which went tick, 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 and you could see the amount of money that you were spending. Our telephone calls are very efficient. We need the telephone call tick, tick, tick when we're using natural resources. We'd use them a lot more efficiently. Thank you very much for that analogy. Um, Tim, a couple of words on what you've heard this morning. Yes, thank you. Um, and I agree completely with that, David. On, uh, well, uh, the two final speakers in Germany and Romania both talked about, um, well, in Germany, about less, lessons, uh, standards, and guidance, um, and uh, something about best practice. And um, so the thing that occurred to me, because I'm the city's guy here, and I'm thinking about all those little chickens out there trying to lay eggs uh, in a clean environmental way, uh, also need to be brought into the, into the game some, and that to, uh, in the standard setting and in the guidance, to lay down some uh, pathway to recognize the urban organizations that are representing cities at the local level. And I think we had a perfect example of that from the speaker from Romania who mentioned the 26 cities who were uh, involved in the EU uh, Herb Act. Uh, and so on green investments and R&D and framing, uh, that, that's a perfect example of a way to see what cities are doing and to keep up to breast with it. Uh, there's Euro cities, there's Metropolis, there's uh, United Cities and local governments. There's quite a lot of organizations that act as intermediaries that make the job easier. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, Adnan. Thank you. Uh, three things. I think we have to understand how dramatically the situation has changed since the original Rio conference 20 years ago. Um, the patterns of international cooperation, the uh, dynamics of uh, economic growth, distribution of wealth, patterns of trade have changed fundamentally. Uh, but we still couch our international cooperation narrative almost as if that hadn't happened. And I think we have to understand the nature of that change and what it implies for international cooperation. And in this respect, we have to think very carefully that do we continue with our focus on global, normative, broad-ranging type of agreements, which we don't even have the ability to monitor the implementation of? Or do we start taking seriously what several people said, which is that one size doesn't fit all, and we need to look at more tailor-made and more specific uh, approaches to how uh, we're going to address uh, global problems and what contributions people can make? 
from our perspective, one of the more fundamental things is that there is a recognition that if we are going to move to a sustainable energy model, there's not enough public resources for the level of investment that's required to make that transformation. What we have to create is the business case for renewable energy, and with technology costs and uh, innovation, that is becoming a reality. And it's a question of how do you develop policy frameworks that can enable investment, both public and private, to make this transformational change. The second big issue, I think, is that we have to look at our narratives again. We can have an empowering narrative or a disempowering narrative. The disempowering narrative that we've all become very used to is when dealing with global problems, we accentuate all the problems that we are facing. We are deluged daily with, you know, climate trends, biodiversity loss, sea level rise, uh, oceans degradation, and so on, and no solutions. Focusing purely on the problems is disempowering. Looking at where the solutions are is the empowering act. And I think that the focus of intergovernmental discussion has to shift much more decisively to an empowering narrative of where we find the solutions. And the third is that there are you know, very unexpected changes that have been happening. If you look at the revolution in tele telecommunications and information communication technology, you've gone in many developing countries. In, in my country, I come from Kenya. I remember growing up with a landline which would work about 15% of the time, and then you'd have to bribe somebody to come and fix it, and that would take six months. Now we have 95% penetration of mobile telephony. It's dramatically changed how people communicate. It's allowed the development of applications that allow transfer of small amounts of money, and huge changes are happening. And it's the same with renewable energy. You take the case of Germany. Everybody very cynically said that the German Energiewende is a way for the Germans to claim that they are not uh, uh, relying on nuclear energy, but they will be exp uh, importing the renewable energy from their neighbors. In fact, this year, Germany is a net exporter of energy without uh, 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 the nuclear, and they are exporting at peak times. So the energy transition in Germany, the transformation, has actually resulted in very unexpected uh, uh, results, and I think those are the kind of results that we need to look for. Thank you. Sorry, it's red. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that upbeat assessment about the need for tailor-made and specific solutions and to be solution-orientated. Olivier, a few brief thoughts. Thank you. Um, just there were a few remarks pertaining to the role of the UN uh, ECE and to regional cooperation in general. I just wanted to point out that in the case of food security and trade, uh, by definition, the problems are regional and the solutions will also be regional. When you're thinking in terms of a drought, in terms of fire, in terms of a pest infection, it uh, doesn't stop at the border. Uh, it's, uh, it always has a regional dimension. And when you think of the solution in terms of trade, uh, regional trade integration definitely is very important. And also in terms of food security, because you want, might want to set up uh, regional stocks and then you need to set up the regional standards because of the regional stocks and so on. And so I think I just wanted, because of all those remarks, to point out that the regional dimension is definitely essential in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. I'm sure those words will resonate uh, with the member states and major groups who I am now going to give the floor to. Um, First of all, from the NGO representative, I'm afraid the traffic light uh, will be on, uh, so you have three minutes to make your thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Leida Reinhardt. I'm from ANPET. It's the Northern Alliance for Sustainability and one of the OPs of uh, the major group of NGOs. If you talk on green economy and the challenges of green economy, mostly we speak, and I see that also in your paper, on technical solutions. But I think what we forget often is the, the opportunities that social innovation and social solutions also give. It's about changing lifestyles, it's about the value shift, it's about paradigm shift, and it's also get out of the locked-in the locked situations, I think. It's not only about eco-efficiency, it's also about sufficiency. It's about uh, sharing instead of owning it's about other business models. 
there are hundreds of promises practices uh, coming from civil society including uh, the business um, you can use I mean it's not only about the experts and the top-down approach uh, there's a lot of research done on this um, I was uh, involved in a two-year program on sustainable lifestyles 2050 and we wrote a roadmap uh, for the European Commission uh, sustainable lifestyles 2050 and including timelines and that roadmap is quite inspiring I think so I'm happy to send it to the people who are interested in, in social innovation as well. Another concern we have is about the growing exclusion of huge groups of society. Although all the nice talks about inclusive growth we see that most action on the ground result in the opposite. Uh, solutions as implementing the junk jobs or whatever, we don't see that as very interesting. In the last Lancet, which is a uh, respectable medical journal, uh, in, the last ver in the last journal you can read, it's about uh, health uh, situation, and I quote, Greece, Spain and Portugal adopted strict fiscal authority and cut down healthcare systems. Suicides and outbreak of infection diseases as a result. Iceland did the opposite rejected austerity measures and no health impacts we can see there. So I think we, we really have to focus also on the social dimension more than we are doing now. So austerity pol policies we think are unacceptable. I think that governments would better put more energy in banning tax havens, bold regulations on financial transactions and let rich people and companies pay their taxes. The offshore leaks learned us that 22 trillion euro is not paid as taxes, which has to be paid. We need only um, 61 billion euros for achieving the MDGs. That is 328 times less than uh, you could have if you only asked for legal taxes to, pay, to be paid by rich people and the companies. So I think what we need is more political will and also putting priorities in our policies. Thank you very much much and indeed there were some nodding heads on the uh, panel there. Um, I would now like to give the floor to the Russian Federation. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. The Russian Federation supports the decision of the Conference on Sustainable Development uh, in Rio, uh, which uh, stressed the importance of a comprehensive uh, solution to issues on the basis of integration, social development, economic growth and environmental protection. A country would like to see compliance uh, within the ECE with the Rio 20, Rio plus 20 uh, agreed principles on a green economy. It's essential that when building such an economy we take account of socio-economic features uh, inherent in each state. Key elements in the Russian approach uh, to the green economy concept are energy efficiency, an optimum balance between economic development and environmental conservation, and the introduction of innovative uh, approaches. Our economic development uh, and, le and policy for it is the most important uh, tool uh, to work towards an innovative uh, economy and to achieve the aims set down in our long-term policy up to 2020. The basic element of the green economy or green growth is at the basis of the adoption of decisions in 2008 and 2011 on the enhancement of energy and environmental effectiveness of the economy by 40% and by 2020 increasing the share of renewables and the overall volume of electricity produced up to 3.5 percent from under 1 percent. We'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the introduction of frontline standards and in technology in industry, energy, uh, technology and infrastructure costs a lot and this can be done we only for com in countries with a sufficient economic potential and in this context we greatly appreciate the practical recommendations of the ECE to provide incentives to e for economic growth as formulated in the Commission's sub-program on economic cooperation, integration and trade. A particular role in modernization and in the innovative development is played by energy. It's important to promote access for countries to contemporary energy services, reducing the intensity of overall consumption and uh, the overall shares of energy consumption in 
sustainable development efforts. We attach a lot of importance to practical work done in the ECE to disseminate agricultural quality standards. And the Commission here plays a unique role because of its functions. It uses the means for technical regulation to resolve current uh, trade problems in the region and at the same time uh, to increase food security. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments on the UNECE and on Russia's approach to the green economy. We now pass on to the OSCE. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am sure that the presentations we heard today may lead to a more sustainable development to new programs and projects in this regard. OSCE has a mandate to identify, monitor and counter threats and challenges to security and stability caused by economic and environmental factors. We believe economic and environmental issues are excellent fields for cooperation and confidence building among uh, neighboring countries. It is based on this understanding that the OSCE, as the world's largest regional security organization, attaches great importance to environment and sustainable development issues like transboundary water management, sustainable energy, climate change, and sustainable transport. As we heard today, increasing cooperation among urban centers may lead to sustainable housing and transportation policies in metropolitan areas. But we should not forget the importance of public participation for sustainable development. In OSCE region, the ratification and implementation of the Aarhus Convention has significantly stimulated the democratic process of public participation in environmental decision-making and sustainable development. Together with our partners, we should in intensify our efforts to transform these principles into concrete action at the local level through the Aarhus centers. I must also emphasize our collaboration with intergovernmental organizations within the Environment and Security Initiative, MSEC, in Central Asia, South Caucasus, Eastern Europe, and Southeastern Europe. These organizations are UNECE, UNEP, UNDP, REC, and NATO as associate partner. As the last point, uh, I want to say that the outcome document of uh, outcome document Rio uh, plus 20 does not have a specific reference to the linkages between sustainable development and peace, security, and stability, which had been strongly emphasized in Rio 20 years ago. But we are confident that Rio plus 20 follow-up process will continue to address these linkages effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those comments on linkages. I would now like to give the floor to Belarus. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. And I'd also like to thank uh, our panelists who made some very interesting and useful presentations. A few general thoughts uh, on what we're considering at the moment. We feel it uh, essential that we are having this uh, session of the ECE against the backdrop of the serious role played by regional commissions, as was pointed out by the speakers, including in the implementation of Rio Plus 20 decisions. The ECE, whose activities in the field of sustainable development are unique uh, through, within the UN system in many ways, has to be actively involved in all this work. Sustainable development simply isn't poss 
people without taking account of the environmental component of the national economy. And the task of environmentalizing, greening the economy is uh, an intricate, complicated matter. So the EC as a center for regional efforts for this far from easy affair uh, has some very important work to do. And uh, a part of the mechanism uh, we see uh, uh, in the whole of the sub programs, uh, I mean, it has to run through, all that has to run through. Uh, we have to make sure there's proper coordination and uh, there's complementarity in everything done. The future of sustainable development uh, means both transformation and uh, a shift. Uh, you need uh, an input uh, for the transfer to green economy, and that is. Uh, how we can ensure transformation in energy, transport, land use, and in forestry. We greatly appreciate the efforts which have already been undertaken by the EC to share knowledge, practice, uh, experience, and know-how in fields such as energy savings, uh, reducing environmental impact, pollution cleanup, uh, waste processing. And we do think that that list of issues will never be exhausted, and we need to uh, expand it. Second issue is the question of investment, uh, without which you can't transform. First and foremost, we're looking at in investment for environmentally clean technology to introduce uh, existing resource effective and environmentally clean technology. And finally, investment in infrastructure to, to ensure that we green all of the sectors of the economy. Transformation for sustainability, uh, I mean, you have the EC's work to optimize and enhance uh, into regional trade issues. This is a very important requirement to achieve sustainable, economical, environmental, and social development region-wide. Thank you. Moderator's microphone, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator, for giving me the floor. Croatia aligns itself with the statement delivered by the EU earlier today. We would like to express our support for the work of Economic Commission for Europe in promoting a balanced integration of the economic, social and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. Somehow it seems that green economy is in the focus of our deliberation today, so I would like to add some, some more comments. One of the very important challenges is how to unlock market for green products as market share of green products is very limited and companies need support for green, greening their value chain and save energy, carbon, water, materials and reduce waste, which are some of the most efficient ways, ways to cut costs. Investments and finance has played and will continue to play a key role in the transition towards green economies. Although the mobilization of funds for investments necessary for the transition towards green economies is a challenging task at the time of global economic and financial crisis. However, a policy as well as a regulatory framework has to be in place so that funds for these investments are made available. We would like to highlight here the successful green business support program in Croatia developed through the project of conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in the Dalmatian coast through greening coastal development. It generated 97 green business projects in four countries with a portfolio value of more than 28 million US dollars. The innovative approach of the project found the way of engaging the private banking sector in co-financing green business ideas by reducing investment risks through innovative mechanism. In addition, the project highlighted the importance of small business support infrastructure at the regional level. Emerging challenges require innovative responses, a part of it provided for by the Green Economy Agenda, which offers a concept of economic development based on good governance, resource, efficiency, and respect for social capital that will be sustainable. And Croatia is strongly committed to this agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments on green business and investment, Croatia. I now give the floor to the representative of the women's group. 
thank you very much. Um, my name is Sasha Gamizon. I'm the director of Women in Europe for Common Future, but I'm here speaking on behalf of the women's major group. And um, looking at the gender balance of the speakers this morning, I was wondering if maybe the UNEC region might be benefiting from a gender equality strategy. Um, but uh, let me just continue. The women's major group is one of the nine major groups established at Rio 1992. And uh, we have um, 400 active organizations from 80 countries giving input in this process of Rio plus 20 follow-up and the post-2015. Um, and we have listened with interest to the panel interventions this morning, and I have two questions and one comment. Um, the question is um, relating to David Stenner's intervention on the learning the lessons uh, from what we have already. And um, I think we have a lot of very interesting goals, targets and mechanisms um, for green economy um, strategies in this region already. So my question is, can we use these very valuable um, processes we have, the UN ECE conventions, for example, on water? Um, can, we, can we have them strengthened? And also, I wanted to highlight the process on environmental health by the UNEC and the World Health Organization Europe with the Parma Declaration, which has very concrete targets and time-bound um, uh, goals. And um, we know that the non-communicable uh, diseases make 60% of the entire burden of disease. And we know that environmental factors and pollution are maybe one of the main causes of these diseases. Uh, and clearly, this is something which I feel um, is, has been missing so far in the presentations, the environmental health aspect. Um, can this be a priority area? And then the area of social protection and inclusion seems to be um, so far missing in the discussions. We as the women's major group um, agreed that the MDG 1 on poverty eradication could have been achieved with the global social protection floor, which would not cost more than 1 to 2% of global GDP. The money is there. I completely agree with my neighbor from the NGOs. Um, the money is in the tax havens, and it's uh, in places like Cyprus, and it's time that this becomes transparent and that these taxes um, are helping to create inclusive and equitable economies. So my question is, can the EC, the EEA, UNEP, UNEC, WHO, ILO, FLO, and the civil society organizations map the um, goals and targets which we have already and how can they be a basis for a um, post-2015 framework um, for this region? Um, also, the proposal by the Secretary of State of Romania on national strategies for green economies, I think, is very important. And I would like to see if this is something which can be taken up. Uh, I was just wondering about the term. We know that there was some criticism about the term green economy as standing for green washing. So can we maybe use the term green and equitable economies instead, also for the UNEC region? And my final comment is on food security. Food is very important for women, <laughs> not just because we like eating, but also because in many regions, women uh, are responsible for feeding their families. And in Africa, many of the farmers are women, up to 80% in some countries. And so we are quite unhappy with the text on food security in the, in the document we received from the Secretariat that focuses mostly on trade and on reducing barriers for food imports. And we think this is um, language from the 80s and we have come much further. And we would really need to focus on some of the problems of the current agricultural Could model, I which were mentioned by Mr. Could I interrupt you? because otherwise I will be accused of bias because you said you would like um, more female panelists and you have gone over your time. From global value change to sustainable local and regional food value chains. That should be the focus. And uh, if we can set targets for that under post-2015 SDGs, that we move to 100% sustainable agricultural regional value change for food, that would be really something which we could uh, benefit a lot from. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for those questions. Um, I will ask the panellists very briefly to respond to those questions uh, before I give the floor again to various member states and groups. Uh, David, there was a specific question to you there, um, as I understand it, on environmental health. 
There were two I heard. Environmental health, certainly, I think the broader question is to do with can we utilise, map maybe, and disseminate uh, the existing targets and goals that we've got so that these can act as a basis for the developing uh, in the post-2015 development agenda? And the quick answer is yes. I think there are a number of activities already underway to do that, and I think it's a really good proposal. Um, and in terms of environmental health, I think in my initial comments, when we talk about the basis of the green economy, you've got to ensure that all of that is to do with health and well-being, which I think absolutely connects with the Palmer agenda. Olivier, would you like to pick up on food security? Um, no, yes. I mean, I, I, I fully agree with, uh, with the remarks, and I think that uh, already in practice, uh, I had mentioned it in the, in the presentation, I mean, the, the, the fragile groups, which are uh, the women and the children, are already targeted by many of the support uh, programs. I mean, you think of the Sun program for, uh, for nutritional value of food and lots of, pro of programs who help the mother and the children. Um, I think also of programs like for instance, Barrick, I was mentioning some private sector program. Uh, Barrick, who is in the mine industry uh, where all the men work, uh, also developed a program to cultivate sun dried tomatoes that the, the spouses of the men uh, are also uh, uh, taking uh, in charge. So I think there is, uh, I mean, all those dimensions are definitely part of the, of the picture nowadays. And uh, I mean, you, if, if we gave the impression that it was not part of it, uh, that's, a, that's a wrong impression. But uh, it's definitely, I mean, uh, even if you look in the G20 text and everything, the so small order farmers, the women and children are always uh, targeted by, uh, uh, by the programs. Thank you. And you also made the point on organising mapping of the targets on social protection and inclusion. Is there anybody on the panel? David? Yeah. Yes. I addressed that already. I think, yes, there is scope to do that. And I think if we don't do that, then we'll be able to recreate the wheel. So certainly when we talk about uh, the, the, the 2015, post-2015 uh, targets and development agendas and the SDGs, we must do that on the basis of what already we have on the table. So I would like to thank the representative for the women's group for those questions and I think there's most probably been an agenda point about having a female panellist uh, next time. Uh, we now move on to Italy, please. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Moderator and distinguished delegates. First of all, I wish to say that Italy uh, agrees and supports uh, what has been expressed by the representative of the European Commission on behalf of the European Union and uh, uh, its member states. Uh, in June uh, 2012, in the, the Rio Plus 20 conference, he indicated that, that we must move towards sustainable development uh, and an inclusive green economy was recognized as an important tool uh, for achieving it, uh, enhancing our ability to manage natural resources sustainably. Uh, countries also recognize that in order to be effective, green economy policies should foster innovation and technology and be supported by an enabling environment and well-functioning institutions at all levels. Uh, the real turning point, uh, in our view, is uh, to sustain governments to make uh, dirty productions less profitable and at the same time to stimulate research and development on clean, on clean technologies. This could be accomplished by a combination of carbon pricing and the diffusion of low carbon technologies, also balancing the costs and the benefits of climate protection. UNEC region has both middle and high income countries. Some countries could take the lead in the transition to green economy and facilitate the deployment of clean technologies all over the region, also proving that the economic slowdown has to be seen as an opportunity to make the switch to a long-term low-carbon economy. Generally speaking, we need a new kind of economic strategy, both within countries and the entire region, to bring about the scale of technology change that we need in the next decades to put our countries on to a sustainable course. 
the Green Agenda may differ in the assumptions, conceptualization, and assigned goals uh, in different countries, but the overarching objective to decouple economic growth from environmental degradation has to be commonly shared. For the same reason, there are significant challenges in how the transition from the current resource-intensive economy system, economic system towards a future low-carbon resource-efficient economy has to be realized with different implications for countries. Uh, let me, uh, for, before to conclude, uh, very, very quickly uh, recall three points on which Italy wishes to highlight uh, uh, main elements of reflection in the roadmap to achieve a, a structural change. First, the impact on the three components of sustainable development, including uh, decent job creation and improved quality of life. To this end, uh, in the last year, the Italian Ministry of Environment has created the fund that provides low interest loans for projects and initiatives in the areas of green economy and in sectors related to the safety against the hydrogeological risk that is particularly uh, 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 important in, in my country. Second, to remove harmful subsidies, uh, despite increasing awareness, the prevalence of perverse subsidies continue to distort price signals and efficient resource allocation. And their reform is both a priority and a major challenge. In 2010, uh, the Italian Ministry of, of Economy and Finance launched the, the first comprehensive review of the tax expenditure. This provides a good basis for further efforts to identify and reform tax expenditure. Third and final point, to improve resource productivity in order to reduce in a cost-efficient way the negative environmental impacts associated with the production, use and end-of-life management of natural resources. Always the Italian Ministry of Environment has co-financed projects for the analysis of the carbon footprint in the whole life cycle of products so as to support the use of low-carbon content technologies uh, and good practices in manufacturing processes. Thank to conclude, you. the commitment of Italy to develop national policies and measures uh, as a means for reorienting the economy and promoting sustainable production and consumption represents the biggest challenge in a time of economic downturn, as it entails in particular ensuring a just, fair and equitable transition toward green economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Austria. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, thank you also to the panelists and the presenters for their most insightful ideas. And let me first of all underline that, of course, Austria, how could it be otherwise, fully subscribes to the statement delivered by the European Union. Now, since you have asked to um, comment on best uh, uh, practices at home, let me underline two topics. The first one is on green jobs. In 2010, the Austrian Ministry for Agriculture, Forestry, Environment and Water Management developed a master plan, Green Jobs, in order to establish a strategy to increase employment in the environmental goods and services sector, which means green jobs. The objective of the master plan, Green Jobs, is to create additional 100,000 green jobs, especially in the sectors agriculture and forestry, environmental technology and renewable energies, as well as tourism. There are currently about 200,000 green jobs in Austria. This means that every 20th job is a green job. Speaking of green, I cannot see my green light, so I beg your indulgence if I'm too long. Some 11% of the GDP are yielded in this sector. In 2011, the number of enterprises producing environmental technologies was estimated at 390 companies. The turnover generated has increased more than five times since 1993 and amounted to 8.2 billion euros, out of which 6 billion were due to exports, which multiplied by four in the period between 1997 and 2011. Environmental technology provides employment for around 
28,600 persons. On food security, allow me to underline that Austria supports the FAO voluntary guidelines on land tenure and also the ongoing process on responsible agricultural investment in the framework of the Committee on World Food Security. <clears throat> Austria also gives great attention to the topics of food waste and food losses. In the context of sustainability, the reduction of food waste and food losses during the whole production chain is highly important. The unsustainable use and handling of food is responsible for hundreds of millions of tons of unnecessarily produced food and at the same time for hundreds of millions of tons of carbon dioxide emissions. This problem concerns developing countries as well as developed countries and it is time to find a common approach to face this issue. For this reason, Austria repeatedly called for voluntary guidelines on, waste, on food waste and food losses in various bodies and committees of the FAO, OECD and the EU. Austria has also started various campaigns to handle this challenge at the national level. One of them is called Food is Precious. The Austrian campaign to helps to prevent Austria food... Austria that we've now gone from green to red. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to thank you very much for your remarks on green job initiatives and on the challenge of food security. And now give the floor to Slovenia. Thank you for giving me a floor. I would like to, to join in thanking all panelists for interesting uh, presentations. Uh, Slovenia is, as an EU member, of course, fully sub subscribes what was stated from the Commission side. Um, Slovenia is also developing uh, a national development strategy for 2020, and it, it will include sustainable principles and even in greater extent. Sustainable development is also an important issue and priority for Slovenian civil society under the title Zazeleni Razvojni Preboj for Green Development, they have been promoting concrete measures for more sustainable development for Slovenia. Building on its rich biodiversity and natural resources, Slovenia is ready to share its expertise in forest water management with others. Becoming an official development donor in 2004, we also took an, our share of global responsibility by integrating sustainable development into our official development aid. Sustainable development is also a visible theme in our foreign policy. Through foreign policy, we are contributing to implementation of Rio Plus 20 outcomes, also through our membership in Open Working Group on SDGs. We believe that SDGs will give the, uh, the world guidance for further development and sustainable manner. Uh, and to conclude, in Slovenia, we believe that achieving sustainability and eradicating poverty are interlinked. In this regard, we are supporting the elaboration of universal overarching post-2015 framework agenda. And we also believe that it should incorporate human rights-based approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would now like to give the floor to the IAEA. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start uh, with a reflection to the keynote. Um, I think equity is a very important aspect um, of uh, sustainable development, and the energy aspects are currently being deba debated whether energy should become a uh, sustainable development goes on its own right in the past uh, 2015 framework, or uh, it should become just an, as an enabler, as it was the case in the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the energy aspects, the access and the often forget, uh, forgotten affordability issues um, 
are uh, explored uh, by us uh, together with the Sustainable Energy for All initiatives and the UN Energy uh, to explore the various techno-economic issues and uh, to resolve this uh, problem. Um, it was good to hear the good news about renewables. Uh, I would like to make three remarks to that. First, yes, the unit costs of renewables are declining. Unfortunately, their increasing share in power generation involves increasing balancing and capacity reserve costs, court system costs. The OECD has just published a report uh, based on case studies from eight to 10 countries uh, indicating that, uh, for example, a 30% uh, share of solar generation in Germany uh, would uh, come to uh, 80 euros per megawatt hour as a system cost. This is an extreme case, but $20, $30 per megawatt hour are common for a 10% share and 40, 50 uh, mm, dollars per megawatt hour for a 30% share of most of the renewable energy sources in the countries involved in that study. Um, the second is uh, about China. Uh, China is the largest in just about uh, everything. China has not only the largest renewable uh, energy program, but also the largest nuclear energy program. In uh, the spirit of the International Energy Agency's uh, statement, all energy sources and technologies will be needed to satisfy the fast-growing energy demand, not only in China and the Gulf, but also in the world as a whole. Uh, finally, back in the 1970s, there was a debate about the oil and nuclear energy as competitors. They turned out to be complements. Uh, recently, we witnessed some discussion about renewables and nuclear energy as competitors. In fact, as we take a closer look, they have a lot in common. They are low carbon technologies uh, and uh, they draw on practically non depletable resources. One big difference is uh, intermittency versus dispatchable energy. And um, this is one reason why integrating nuclear uh, and renewables in uh, the grid, depending on the climatic and other geographical conditions, seems to be a good idea that we are exploring. Thanks. Thank you very much. I would now like to give the floor to WHO Europe. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and I would like to thank also the panelists for an extremely interesting and, and uh, encouraging discussions. So being from the World Health Organization, of course, I could not stop but start emphasizing the links between better health, economy, and environmental sustainability, which are well established. We all know that people who are healthy are better to be able to learn, to earn, and to contribute positively to the societies in which they live. We think in this aspect, Rio Plus 20 offered an excellent opportunity to re-examine the relationship between health and sustainable development, putting human beings and their well-being at the center of development. So healthy people contribute to sustainable development. But at the same time, we know that policies that promote sustainability benefit human health. The health of populations and how equitably health is distributed provide a yardstick to judge progress across all aspects of economic, social, and environmental policy. In the health sector, we see new ways are emerging to improve the health. We see that there are new technologies. We are working on a sustainable and resilient health sector, so-called greening the health sector. There are new opportunities for connectivity, and there are also new models of citizens' participation in decision-making. But at the same time, our notion of good health is evolving. It's shifting towards good health and well-being rather than merely preventing and treating the diseases. And we know that health systems must adapt to these changes. There are higher expectations from the societies. There are new demographic and environmental and health challenges. We see an increasing burden of non-communicable diseases, regardless of the income level of the countries. There are about 1.8 billion adolescents in the world who require special care, 
but also the countries are facing a rapidly aging populations. And moreover, climate change, migration, unplanned urbanization, environmental risk factors like air, water, and chemical pollution all trigger new threats to health. WHO, together with UNICEF, has been leading the post-2015 development agenda health thematic uh, consultations. And so far, the consensus developed indicates that health is determined by many aspects of development, including education, sustainable energy and nutrition, water and sanitation, climate change adaptation and mitigation. So it will be important that health is both an outcome and a prayer request to reducing poverty and a critical contributor to sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And our last intervention from the floor will come from the Energy Charter Secretariat. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I would uh, like to thank also the organizers of the UNECE to have uh, invited us. My name is Stephen De Filla. I'm director at the Energy Charter Secretariat. Uh, I would like to, to thank the speakers and the moderators for this very interesting discussion. Uh, let me briefly present um, what uh, the, the, the actuality is of, of the Energy Charter for the topics we are discussing today. We are an inter intergovernmental organization which is headquartered in Brussels. Our constituency is very similar to the one of the UNECE. That is why our cooperation is very important in this subject. We have two uh, major pillars. Uh, one is a political declaration where we have about uh, 75 states which, are, which have signed it. And the other one is a, a legal framework for the uh, cooperation in the, legal, in the energy sector at large. It contains uh, provisions on trade, on transit, on investment, on the, energy, on the energy efficiency, on dispute settlement. And we also have um, a, um, an industry advisory panel. Um, our constituency has charged us in a mandate dating from uh, November last year to undergo a certain modernization of our process. Um, uh, it is a political mandate to update the basic documents uh, which we have, which we govern, govern us. First of all, the objective is to enlarge membership and to have a, a better outreach, especially to Northern Africa and to Southeast Asia, and also to enhance cooperation with other international organizations. Uh, the second um, uh, aspect of that modernization concern, concerns low carbon assessment. Our constituency has charged us to, 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 to carry out a low carbon assessment of our treaty and, and its protocol. Um, and is, is certain subjects have uh, emerged from that assessment. First of all, uh, uh, the elimination of fossil fuel subsidies has, re has received uh, very much the interest of uh, our constituency. Uh, secondly, uh, the, um, uh, the setting up uh, of regional low carbon infrastructures, especially uh, DC cables for transporting uh, renewable electricity. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the work uh, at the city levels uh, has become important. Uh, we are participating in a project which uh, implies uh, the, covenant, the covenant of mayors going east into four cities in four different countries, namely Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, where we are implementing uh, uh, local action plans, uh, sustainability action plans. Uh, so my main message here is that we are ready to, co to cooperate with the UNECE uh, and all its member states on the realization of, uh, the, of the, the sustainability goals. And if you allow me, I just, uh, I just would like to announce an event, the, our next event, which we are holding here next door to the, to, uh, together with the WTO on 29th of April. Uh, uh, this month, uh, we are holding a high-level workshop on the role of energy uh, ag uh, agreements mm -hmm. in, in, in international trade. Uh, so, and, and uh, everything you can find on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your timing was impeccable. I'd like to thank also the member states and major groups for very much keeping to three minutes. It was excellent. I'm just going to put our panellists on the spot. I'm going to give them 30 seconds each to make their final remarks. David Stanners. Wow. Equity means 
Um, it's the same as respect. Listen to citizens who hold key knowledge. Toyota's success was listening to people on the shop floor. Address the losers, this is what IASD says, support and facilitate transformations and transitions. Inc interlinkages are important, avoid cherry picking and uh, un setting up unintentional trade-offs. Wind, for example, is not good because it doesn't solve the whole energy process. Finally, embrace complexity and uncertainties. Nassim N Nicholas Taleb in his new book says, resilience is a sissy concept. What we need is anti-fragility, things which grow under stress. Read the book. <laughs> uh Tim Campbell, a no plug for your book, please. No, but, but I did read that book, and it's, it's quite good. Um, well, three, or at least three, maybe four of the speakers talked about inclusion, um, uh, equity, uh, social participation. Uh, all of these things, uh, if you think about it, you know, hap happen more uh, fully, let us say, at the local level, uh, where cities are, where the issues hit the road. And uh, where the rubber hits the road, and so, uh, but the, the the flip side of that is that you get pushback sometimes as well. So it, these issues of green economy and low carbon and so on may not be topmost on people's minds when they're living uh, in the mud or uh, have other uh, problems to solve. So I think it's just something to bear in mind. Thanks. Thank you, Olivier. Food security and trade. I just stressed in my previous uh, remarks, I mean, the importance of the regional dimension and uh, uh, listening to the interventions from uh, the representatives here and the civil society in particular, I think also we need to stress that it has to be a multi-stakeholder uh, solution. Uh, that means that uh, it, it's not a solution coming from the public sector only. It should also in involve the private sector. It should involve the civil society. And uh, it shouldn't be uh, a top-down uh, solution, but a bottom-up solution. So we need to start from the ground and talk to people, I mean, the, the, either the women or, or the other farmers uh, on the field uh, to see what their problems are and how to solve them. And we have started to do it uh, in Africa with the CADEP process. Now we have seen that the World Economic Forum has joined also the CADEP process, and there is this Grow Africa uh, initiative, and we see that those holistic uh, initiatives involving everybody are the ones that work best. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists who've given us much food for thought. I would now like to hand over to the Ambassador of Israel, Mr. Manor, who will close this panel and open the next panel session. I would like to thank our excellent moderator and all the panelists who have taken part in this panel on the future of sustainability from transition to transformation. Although I was uh, unable to be here when the panel started before lunchtime, what I have heard in this afternoon's discussion was a very lively debate. I would also like to thank the keynote speaker, Mr. Halle, who had to leave, for his inspiring speech with a lot of food for thought, as well as all those who have actively participated from the floor. And I would like also to thank especially the Dutch Permanent Mission for providing the beautiful tulips adorning the podium today. I close panel A and it is time to move to the panel B on sustainable development governance. I now invite the panelists for panel B to come up to the podium. Thank you.